Sure. So welcome again. I am Frank Scornia. Uh, for those who kind of just missed my introduction, I am the uh, digital librarian for adult information services at the Ferguson Library in Stamford, Connecticut. Um, I'm also a, um, a Twitch enthusiast um, and technological enthusiast. So I kind of like playing around with this technology and uh, I also like teaching this technology. So it's kind of a lot of fun. So Today, okay, let me uh, not see the link. Let me just kind of just drop it again quickly to make sure everybody saw it. Uh, it should be just like a little PDF that will show up in the chat shared to everybody. Um, so yeah, so what we're going to be kind of looking at tonight is uh, we're going to be looking at what OBS is. There's, there's a piece of software out there called OBS, Open Broadcasting Software Studio. Um, I Everybody just kind of kind of shortens it to OBS. Uh, so we're going to look at what it is and kind of what it can do. Um, and it's an extremely, I find it to be an extremely powerful, flexible piece of software. Um, and so we'll kind of look at some of those different uses there and such. Um, we're going to look at kind of like what kind of equipment that you need uh, to get started with live streaming. And then as you, if you want to continue and kind of con uh, as a hobby or for some people who really want to get into it as a, um, uh, as a business, because th there are people out there who do make their lives out of doing this here and such, uh, kind of where the upgrades kind of the equipment goes. So how to start off at a very basic level and then kind of where the tiers of kind of upgrade for that are. Uh, and then we're going to actually do a demo in OBS. I'm going to actually show kind of and, and kind of go over the terminology of it uses and the interface and how to kind of set up kind of the, the different uh, actions and everything in OBS. So how to use the software itself. Uh, and then finally, we're going to do. I'm going to do kind of a brief discussion on the streaming platforms that are out there and how to connect to them. Uh, and then there's going to be some time for um, talking about safety and kind of just kind of your security online uh, while you're streaming. Uh, and then there'll be room for questions. So uh, if you do have kind of any questions, uh, there'll be time at the end. But if you do ask a question in chat and I see it, and I think it's a good time uh, to answer it there, I'll, I'll kind of do that as well too. So um, what is OBS? So actually, let me jump to the screen and show it to you. So we're going to share, I want to make sure I share screen one, so you're seeing, okay, so you should be seeing my screen here with uh, kind of the background there, I'm going to bring up OBS. So this is, um, did that share? Yeah, okay. So this is OBS. This is the OBS studio. This is the, the latest edition. Um, and uh, a quick kind of interface tour of what we're looking at here. Um, OBS is a, um, is a broadcasting software. So what it's meant to do is it's meant to take content that you have on your computer. And I just wanna make sure I can continue to see the chat. There we go. Um, it allows you to take content that is, is visible on your computer and broadcast it out. And so that's where the kind of the broadcast, uh, open broadcast uh, system studio comes out or software studio comes out. Um, and you can broadcast out to a variety of different platforms, whether it's going to be Twitch, whether it's going to be uh, YouTube, whether it's going to be Facebook. Um, there used to be, Microsoft used to have their Mixer platform. And there, there are other smaller ones out there, but those are the three big ones, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. Um, it also has the capability of being a recording software. Uh, so if you didn't want to broadcast that, if you want to just do it to kind of make recordings on your computer, it, uh, you can do that as well too. And so when a lot of people think of live streaming, uh, they, they think of video games. It's all about video games. And that's kind of what I'm going to be demonstrating a bit. But uh, OBS can record anything that you see on your computer. So you can do things like web pages or other software. So it's, it's a really great tool for things like, um, or like making tutorials. Um, if you need to kind of be able to show somebody how to do something, you could, you could bring it up, uh, bring, record it in OBS, save it, and it gets recorded as a video file. You just get a simple video file that you can send or share as you need to, to kind of show that process that you did on the, on the computer. So it has its use both as streaming or recording what's on your computer and then also broadcasting it out over kind of the internet. Uh, yeah, so you, uh, there's a question, as a professor, can I send to students? You can if you send it, like if you send them the link to the platform that you're going to. So you can't directly share from OBS to your students, but you can say, set up, say like on YouTube. Um, you, I, I find, uh, and later on, I'm gonna kind of talk about the, the pros and cons of the different platforms, but something like that there, YouTube's kind of like a good choice because it allows, because um, everybody knows how to use YouTube. Um, it's, a, it's an interface that they're really familiar with. 
and you don't need to have an account usually to interact or, or view. Actually, I'm trying to think in the chat, I think you do need to have an, a Google account. But um, but you, what you do is, you, and the thing with YouTube is you can share private links or unlisted links. So like if you're doing something just for your students, you could set it up as an unlisted link, which means that if somebody did a search on YouTube, they would not see it. Um, but you, with that link, you can then share it to your students and only the, and then they would be able to connect and see that you have on there. So yeah, so it, it is something. And so you can also do the same thing with the recordings. You can make a recording of whatever you're doing, upload it to YouTube. You would create a channel up there and you would upload it. And it would just be like a YouTube video, like all the things that we watch every day all the time. Um, but you can then make it unlisted so that what happens is if somebody searches for it, they won't find it, but you can share that link with the people that you want to watch it. Um, or you can make it public if it's something that you want to share publicly. Um, so this is the, the interface for OBS. And so what happens is, is this big section right up here on the top is kind of a preview or it's, it's the view of what's being sent out and broadcasted. Right now it's black because we don't have anything going on in there. Um, coming down to the left, we have our scenes and our sources. And when I, when I really get into this demo, we'll talk about kind of what these are. Uh, there's the audio mixer. Audio has become, uh, and audio has become a much more powerful thing in OBS. It used to be kind of like a side thought, um, but they've done a lot of improvements uh, with that. Uh, and I think the next version, something I've been reading about, I mean, right now we're in version uh, 27. Uh, 28 is coming up, and there's some like, new big changes I think they're doing to audio in that too. Um, and then over here, we just have the controls. And again, I'm going to I'm going to come back to this after I, I talk a little bit about equipment. Um, but I just kind of when I talked about OBS, I just wanted you to be able to kind of see what it was um, uh, before we kind of get into it there. So, uh, okay, so yeah, so that's the OBS, uh, just kind of making sure I'm following my notes here. Okay, so the first thing I kind of really want to do talk about is the equipment. Um, a lot of people seem to think that it, there's a, a big technological kind of requirement to get into live streaming. And in reality, all you really need is a computer with an internet connection. It could be any, it could be any desktop computer, any laptop computer. Uh, some of the more fancy things that we see in live streaming, so things like the, the face cams and uh, microphones and all the, the, the fancy overlays and effects there and such, that is all just kind of software or additional equipment on top of what you really need. Um, so OBS, all it really needs, you don't even need to have a camera. So we have the camera here, you're seeing my face talking. I have a webcam connected to my computer, but in order to use the OBS, I don't even need that there. I just really, if I wanted to use OBS to record, like say teaching an Excel tutorial or something and such, I could open it up, open up Excel, um, and, and walk through it. Now, if I wanted to record a voiceover, I would need a microphone. In order to show my face like we do, I need to have a webcam. So you can see in order to start adding more capabilities and features to what you're live streaming with OBS, uh, you do need to have more equipment. But at the very base, you just need to have a computer with an internet connection. Now, almost every laptop that you buy nowadays, laptop or notebook computer, has a built-in webcam and microphone. So if you wanted to get into live streaming and you wanted to add in that, that face cam and record and include your voice kind of uh, speaking over and uh, with the audio of whatever you're doing, um, a basic laptop, again, has all of that built into it. It's not the best technology uh, for that there, but for somebody getting started that just kind of wants to play around and try things out, it's a really good inexpensive way to start because most people are working on notebook computers already. So like right from the start, that's kind of really all that you need is you need a computer. Um, and if you're using a notebook computer, you have a camera and you have your microphone kind of built in. Now, if you really want to get into it and you start kind of adding on to it uh, and start wanting to improve the quality of what you're making, that's when you start looking at upgrading different pieces of equipment. And so the first piece of equipment uh, that you really uh, want to upgrade, in, in my opinion, the first thing that people want to upgrade there and such is the microphone. Because what is, really what's the use of having good visuals or if you're, you're talking and presenting if they can't hear or understand you? So as I said, a lot of notebook computers have built-in microphones, um, but the quality really isn't that great. Um, and what happens is, is a lot of times when you're, when you're using that built-in microphone, um, especially if you're not using headphones, um, 
a lot of software is having to do things like have having to do things like noise canceling. And so you've probably noticed the past couple of years if you're using Zoom a lot. And if you don't, if you have say a set of speakers playing out the audio, or instead of using say a pair of headphones, and you're using kind of your built-in um, your microphone. Um, things get choppy, it gets, um, maybe things kind of slow down, uh, maybe things aren't exactly clear, or maybe like some things get cut off. And a lot of that there is because Zoom is using a noise canceling software that they're, they're trying to interpret the noise that their microphone is picking up, whether it's say um, construction noise outside or um, somebody else in the room, say typing on a keyboard, it's gonna pick that up and it's gonna try to suppress it. Um, and so, and also what happens is, is that if you're speaking, um, your microphone's picking it up and then it's playing out of the speakers, it kind of dampens that playing out of the speakers. Um, so there's things to reduce things like feedback. Um, so there's a lot of those kind of things. So what happens is getting like a pair of headphones where you're then able to kind of, the sound is not coming out of the speaker. So it's one less thing the software has to listen, the microphone and the software have to listen to or take care of. And so really the, the first kind of upgrade, if you're trying to keep things on a budget to kind of go along through is to kind of improve the microphone from that little built-in microphone on your notebook computer. Uh, and I, the first thing I would kind of look at is like a headset microphone. So this is just kind of like you have the headphones with kind of a, a, a boom mic that comes down to your mouth. Um, there, you can go from a really inexpensive ones. There are really expensive ones. Uh, just kind of find what kind of fits into your, your balance, uh, into your budget for what you're trying to do. And what it does, it gives you a fairly good microphone um, with sometimes generally a fairly good pair of headphones, um, especially if you're willing to look into some of the gaming technology out there. Gaming has gotten so big that a lot of this tech has kind of focused on there. And so they've made like really good strides on good equipment uh, that's good quality and create and, um, and usually pretty inexpensive if you don't mind kind of a little bit of a gaudy look sometimes. Um, I think I, the gaudy look has been the past couple of years that recently we're starting to see a little bit more gaming tech that's a little bit more muted in kind of how it's presented. Um, so, so it works well again in the office or for the home, but um, it all kind of depends on kind of what you're looking for and finding. Now, if you've had the headset mic, and one of the nice things about the headset mic is, is that it brings, instead of speaking out to a microphone that's kind of way out in front of your face, you know, I'm blocking my face with my, my hand, kind of way out in front of you, it brings the microphone kind of closer to your mouth. And so what happens is, is it's able to focus more on your voice and kind of what you're bringing in instead of all the noise around. Because the microphone on like a notebook computer is trying to pick up everything it can uh, and, and it's trying to pick your voice out of that little bit. So by having that headset, you're able to kind of focus uh, the microphone better. And so you end up with a, a clear voice presentation um, either into Zoom or in this case into like OBS and your, and your live stream. Now going on from the, um, the headset microphone, the, the next kind of upgrade is to look at kind of one of the USB condenser microphones. Um, and I'm wondering if I can kind of raise this up enough. So yeah, you can kind of see, um, and I've pulled out one of my plugs. Um, you can kind of see, I have a blue Yeti kind of microphone here. Um, and what this is, is this is just a, um, a USB. Oh, okay. I had some cables coming out. Uh, <laughs> the fun things of kind of doing all this here. Um, so the, uh, what this is, is this is a kind of a, a more complex microphone built in to kind of uh, bring in kind of different kind of recording patterns. And it's just, it's just like a higher quality microphone, but it just plugs in with a USB cable into my computer. And the, the nice thing about that is, is that it makes it really easy to set up and use. Um, I don't have to figure, figure out kind of different kind of audio connections in. I plug it in and the computer sees it as a microphone. Um, they, they are, they are, they're on the, a little bit on the pricier side, but it's a good quality mic, a good kind of entry into kind of that higher level quality microphone, uh, that's out there kind of moving beyond the, the headset mic. Uh, and then kind of the next step after that is that you could go into the whole range of professional stage, like XLR microphones. XLRs is the, the connection is a three pin connection. Uh, that goes into a, um, a, a prof like a stage or musical microphone. Um, and there's a lot of kind of top level streamers that they, they've moved to using these XLR microphones. One of the advantage of them is that the, the three prongs are designed to carry sound signal uh, and, and from a microphone and the microphones are designed specifically to, to carry a sound signal on, on that three prong format. 
Um, whereas like a USB is, is doing all it's, it has power going along it and there's the limits of the USB connection. I mean, USB has gotten better, but the microphones, there still are limits to how it digitizes, and all the digitizing of the sound happens in the, in the USB microphones. Whereas on these other microphones, they're dedicated for a single purpose. Now, they're, the microphones themselves really aren't that much more expensive than a USB microphone, but in order to use one of those like XLR microphones, you do need to usually have another piece of equipment called an audio interface. And what that does is the audio interface allows you to plug in that, that uh, analog XLR connection and it digitizes the sound out to the, out to the computer. So it all kind of depends on kind of where your level is and your, your kind of and what you want to do budget wise and kind of upgrade along there and such. I've been using this, this Blue Yeti mic now for like six to seven years. And I personally, I don't have a need to upgrade. It's I'm happy with it. It, it gives me the sound quality that I need and it does everything that I need it to do. So I've never felt a need to kind of upgrade and do something else. Um, so that's kind of microphone. You want to kind of make sure that if you're going to have even just like a voiceover, if you're not going to have a face cam, you're not going to have a video of your face or any other kind of video in there and such, but you want to have a voiceover or kind of talking or interacting with, um, say, people who are in your audience, um, you want to kind of make sure that's as clear as possible. And so you can, you can start with the built-in microphone that you have on your computer but the ways to upgrade are going to a headset mic or a USB mic, or eventually even onto those kind of like professional stage microphones. Um, and then, yeah, so that's, um, yeah, so consider what you need kind of on your budget and the content that you want to stream. So you can even do things like if you wanted to like, like a wireless lavalier mic, you could like set up if you want to be able to like walk around a space or, or do something where you're not going to be able to closely connect it to a computer because people live stream everything. I mean, the big thing when people think of live streaming is video games. Um, but people live stream uh, crafts, they do knitting, they do sewing, they do cooking, baking. Uh, kind of thing. So it's really great uh, way. Uh, to, you don't have, if, you, if you're not into video games, but you want to kind of live stream and such, there's a ton of things out there. There's, there's a whole like group of people that I follow and, and watch that they, they read uh, like stories. They find like public domain stories and sit and read them there. And it's just kind of just this nice listening experience uh, that sometimes it's just good to put on in the background. Um, so there, there's like a variety of different uh, uh, things that you can kind of stream, but depending on what you want to do, your equipment has to kind of match with that kind of operation. Uh, so moving on from microphones, the next thing that you would want to upgrade is the camera. So if we're again working from our basic uh, premise that maybe you have a, a laptop computer and you've been using the built-in kind of camera on, on the laptop computer, um, you're limited with kind of the, the positioning of that camera. It's either set up at the very top of your, your monitor, or sometimes there was, a, there was a whole period of time where laptops were that it was coming down at the bottom and gave kind of the up nose kind of look. Uh, I, I, I never understood why they put cameras down there, but it was always this kind of, let's look at the person's nose while they're talking. Um, but you're, you're limited to where, and what happens is, is that usually like if you need to ad adjust your screen to be able to get a better view because of lighting or whatever, uh, you're adjusting where that camera is. So the next step from there is to look at kind of a standalone webcam. Uh, so there's like a whole bunch from like, I mean, it's interesting the past couple of years, it's been really hard to get webcams. I think supplies are finally getting back. There was the supply chain issue. And at the start of uh, the pandemic, everyone was buying them for their, their home setup so that everybody can use Zoom. Uh, they're starting to become a little bit more available and easier to get now. Um, and the nice thing about them is that you can get, a, the webcams are, they're standalone, so you can kind of position them where you want them to go. So like the, what you're seeing me here right now, this is set up on top of my monitor, but it also has like a, a standard tripod mount in there that I could then say, take it off and I could set it up. Like I could either use like a little tabletop tripod and set it up somewhere on my desk, or I can set it up on a full tripod somewhere and still use it uh, to its, to, uh, as its webcam capability. So I'm not limited to it just being mounted on top of my computer. Uh, granted, this one here, it lives on top of my computer and I don't move it anywhere because I like the positioning it's where I want it to be. Um, but the, the, op the option and the capability are there. You also get an upgrade in your resolution. So most laptop cameras built in, well, um, are generally not that high resolution. They're usually limited to about 720p. Um, and what that basically means is that the 
uh, that the, the picture that it creates, the height is 720 pixels high on there. Um, but, and so that's less than like most like older, like most like flat screen TVs, they worked at 1080p, probably seen that 1080i, 1080p uh, kind of refresh, which means that there's 1080 pixels high in, in, the, in the picture. So when you upgrade to a webcam, you can get into either like 1080p cameras or you can get into like 4K, which is the 4,000 pixels. It's actually, uh, I think it's 2160, 2160 pixels high is the, is the 4K um, resolution on there, but they, they just say 4K. And so there's cameras that have those higher resolutions. So again, depending on what you're doing with your live streaming, um, if you wanna have a really good quality for your video input, you want to get a higher resolution. Um, and it, it's generally the, true with like anything that you're doing with any video content is that you want to shoot your video content as at as high a resolution as possible because you can always step down resolution when you when you when you encode it, when you you save it, or if you need to like zoom in on something and kind of uh during your editing process or whatever, uh, you want to make sure that your um uh, that your resolution is as high as possible so that you have as much flexibility with your final product. Um, and then you can always step down to what you need to do. So, so you get that kind of upgrade. And so, and so what happens is also many webcams also come with a built-in microphone. So going back to what my previous point, talking about microphones, um, but the quality there is usually not really that great. Um, so again, really the option for kind of your best kind of quality and best kind of movement is to have a standalone microphone and a standalone camera. So now you're, you're, you're sticking all the stuff on top of your, uh, your laptop um, there and you're ignoring what's, what's built into the laptop. Um, again, laptops are really great place to start. If you have that and you wanna just kind of start experimenting and, and hopping onto Twitch and start doing something there, you don't really need to buy anything. Just go start with your laptop there and kind of uh, in play with that there and such. But as you get into it, these are kind of the upgrades to do. Now, there are a lot of streamers now that they've, they've upgraded from the webcams and they're using things like camcorders or digital SLRs for their, um, for their camera options. Um, and so a lot of camcorder, like a lot of like kind of mid-range to higher end range camcorders and, and digital SLRs now are coming with kind of a live feed that you can connect directly into your USB, uh, USB port on your computer. And it will work like a webcam on your computer. Other ones you need to have kind of like a capture device on hook in. So you, you hook the, the camcorder into another device that then goes, into the computer. Um, and the, the advantages of using like a camcorder or like the digital SLRs is that these are cameras designed specifically for capturing good video. Um, they have better lenses on them. They generally get wider views and the settings in them allow you to fine tune um, the, the video that you're taking a, a lot better than what you can do with the webcam. Webcams generally come with simpler software on the computer that you can adjust things like white balance and you can do some basic zooming um, and you can do maybe a little bit of color correction, but um, camcorders or digital SLRs just have a lot more flexibility and a lot kind of finer tuned settings. Uh, the advantage of something like a digital SLR also is interchangeable lenses. So again, depending on what you want to stream uh, using OBS, um, whether you want to do something more that's more wide angle or something that's more focused and zoomed, you can pop on a different lens and, and use it for kind of different purposes on there too. So you get like one camera that kind of opens up into a lot of it's DSLRs and actually the other things are mirrorless cameras is the other thing. Um, we're not gonna really kind of go into deep into the technology, but they are out there and, and people are starting to use them more and more for this process. Um, especially the digital SLRs because they're, they're smaller form factor. They're not a very deep camera. So they, they work well set up among all the other kind of computer setup. Whereas a camcorder tends to have a little bit longer body now and they tend to be a little bit more uh, finicky with kind of that setup on there. So, You've now upgraded your microphone, you've upgraded your camera to kind of wherever you want it to do. Uh, and so then the next thing that you really want to pay attention to is lighting. Uh, a lot of people tend to kind of forget about lighting. They tend to just use the natural lighting that's around them uh, in the room. And you, you've probably seen this a lot over the past couple of years in kind of Zoom, uh, in Zoom meetings. People have their, and sometimes 
they're they're sitting uh, with like a window behind them and their face is just in shadow or they're in a situation and the light keeps shifting around. So when you're live streaming, and especially if you're going to be doing something like showing a face cam, you want to make sure that your lighting remains consistent and, and it's, it's good lighting. Um, and so there are different kinds of ways. Um, and so it's, it's a good camera is, I have actually in my notes, a good camera is useless if your camera, if your audience can't see you properly. And so that's where you want to kind of light yourself really well. Um, the recommended way to kind of set up lighting is to have what they call a key light. So a key light is a light that's directly shining onto your face. Um, and this is kind of the main light source that kind of presents your, your light to your, uh, to the camera. Um, cause what happens is the light reflects off your face into the camera and that's what captures and kind of sends there. Uh, in addition to your key light, um, what you want to do is what they also recommend is we have what they call a fill light. And so what a fill light is, is it's another light source usually pointed into like an indirect uh, direction. And what it does, it kind of fills in the shadows that are created by uh, the key light. Um, now there are like, like inexpensive and expensive kind of video lighting systems kits out there. Um, if you go into like, uh, yes, a uh, good question. Am I using a key light? I was actually going to demonstrate uh, quickly, actually, my, my lighting setup. Uh, you can kind of see the difference in how things kind of work. Um, but uh, so there are some expensive uh, and inexpensive kind of like video lighting setups out there. Um, but what I use, I actually just use two desk lamps. I have uh, that kind of have the, um, they're actually like the lamps. Have you ever seen like the Pixar logo at the beginning of the bouncing lamp? They're lamps that look like that. Um, and so I have one that's actually pointed like directly at my face. Um, and it, it took a little while to get used to it. It, it took me several months of, of using and streaming with it to have this light shining into my face, but I, I'm pretty used to it. As long as I don't look directly at it, I, I'm used to that there. And then I have another one that's kind of angled down that doubles as my, my desk lamp, what I need to have a lamp on my desk. But let me just kind of quickly, I'm going to move my microphone a little bit and such. Let me demonstrate. This is it when I turn off my fill light. This is kind of what, what uh, the lighting looks like. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing quickly so we have a bigger face. So when you can see, um, the lighting is coming from this side. My, my, key, my key light is coming from this side here. And so you can see all of the shadow over here. And you can actually see the shadow kind of projecting against uh, behind me as well, too. So what happens is the fill light is lighting up this side of my face, and it's helping to kind of get rid of those shadows that are behind me. Now, um, let's bring this back on. And let me just turn off my key light. I turn that off and you can kind of see the, the lights coming from the other side there and you can kind of see uh just kind of the, the difference that like my, my face is lit again from one side of the screen i'm casting a big shadow behind me um but it's also um uh but it's also not as direct as what the the key light was doing now here it is without the lights on it's off again so you can kind of see in my setup here it's really dark um, and so by having this lighting kind of in place, uh, it makes it really visible for me. And now my camera focus again. So, so yeah, so I have that key light shining kind of directly this way, and then, such, and then the fill light's just kind of filling the shadows. Um, and what happens is they're always there and it just kind of gives me a really consistent kind of lighting. Um, I, they're just standard desk lamps, um, and I have LED bulbs in there, so there's no heat. That's actually one of the nice kind of advantages is that by having those LED bulbs, there's no heat just kind of pouring into my face. So I can have them on for, I've had them on for hours at a time, uh, and not really have been affected by it much. Uh, there is usually sometimes recommendations, like if you do this kind of just with the desk lamps, is to get kind of like a diffusing cloth and kind of put like a shade over them. So it, it just kind of spreads the light out in kind of a softer uh, direction. I've never gotten around to doing that, but um, it does kind of help kind of soften this kind of just this bright light kind of constantly shining at me. Um, so having strong and consistent lighting is also really important if you want to be using a green screen. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of other accessories a bit there and such. So green screens, uh, they kind of come in and out of vogue when it comes to uh, live streaming. I think currently I'm not seeing people use them as much as they, they were for a while. 
Um, I'm using one. If I go in here quickly and I can just kind of show you, if I go here, you can kind of see I have my green screen kind of set up behind me. Uh, this is actually just a collapsible um, uh, green screen. It folds up and kind of really nicely. And I have it hanging on a light stand uh, because I don't have like a permanent studio kind of set up uh, in place. So I, I set it up for when I want to be doing my live streaming or when I want to uh, do a, a Zoom class like this year or a Zoom meeting. I kind of set it up a lot for that kind of purpose there. Um, but in order to make the green screen technology work really well, you do need to light it properly. Um, and that's kind of one of the tips out there is that you always kind of see is that um, just having good lighting kind of makes the green back there stand out better so that the software can pick it out be um, better. Um, so one of the advantages, why do I use a green screen? And as I said, the trends kind of change uh, back and forth. Now, again, a lot of people, a lot of them aren't using it and said they have kind of like this like curated background where they, they put in kind of like pictures that they're hanging up or they have like little figurines or just something like in the background, different lighting happening in the background behind them uh, to kind of make their background interesting. Um, one of the nice things about the, the green screen is it allows me to hide the space behind me, which also helps reduce kind of any kind of distractions. Uh, I'm also in a shared space here. So like my, my partner, we're, we're in our, our basement here and my partner, her office space is over to the side, but then the stairs are over on the other side. So by having that behind me uh, allows her to kind of pass behind uh, and go there without kind of showing up on the screen behind me or whatever. It's a distraction. She's if she wants to sit back there and and uh, knit or whatever, she's not in the way. I, I'm not and I'm not like, I'm not kind of sharing her with kind of the rest of the world. So green screens, a uh, good question. Um, how much does a green screen cost? Um, they they come varying kind of amounts. Uh, you could go with just like buying like a a single tone green fabric. Um, and one of the nice things about green screen is that there isn't really a specific green for a green screen. It's what it is, is you just want to have a solid, consistent color uh, in place that then you can actually set what they call chroma key. Uh, chroma key is the technology that, okay, it, it, what you do is you say this color, um, remove it from the video image. So you could just buy like a, a good amount of just green fabric uh, and use that there. Um, the one that I'm using, uh, the prices have varied. It's it's around like eighty to a hundred dollars with kind of the light stand. So the light stand is just a, a collapsible stand that I just hang it off of there. So it's like I've spent about seventy to eighty dollars uh, on it there. Um, and but again, I've had it for about six years, so it's been an investment that I've used for a while. Um, I've recently bought another one that I bring into work when I you do a lot of kind of online stuff at work. Again, I like to have just kind of that that kind of reduce the distracting background behind me kind of look. Um, a, a funny joke, uh, my green screen comes with a reversible, the other side's a blue screen on there. And the first time I tried it, it's like, okay, you know what? Everybody talks about green screen. Let me, let me try the, the blue screen. And like why, like, why did films move from using blue screens to green screens? And the first time I tried it out, I found out my eyes are blue enough that when I set up the chroma key, it actually like chroma keyed out my eyes and I had these like black pits uh, where my eyes, so it was like a really disturbing image. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why actually they don't use blue screen as much um, because, uh, well, not just eyes, but um, green is a lot less frequent color used in like films or TV shows or, or special effects. So they're able to kind of pick it out better. And now it's just become kind of more standard on there, but you do sometimes have to be careful with if you're if you're doing like a chroma key with uh, with a green screen, you have to be careful with what you wear. I'm actually this is actually a, a dark green uh, pullover that I have on, um, but if I wear anything close to the green or like if I have like a like a, a graphic on a T-shirt or something that has a bit of that green, it will like actually disappear uh, in the. Um, uh, with the chroma key. And so th th there have been times where like I've gone on, like I've, I've planned, I've done like a, I've gone on to do a, like a live stream like one evening and I realized, okay, I have to actually go change my shirt because otherwise it would be kind of distracting. And I've, I've wanted to do uh, kind of a set. I, I haven't been able to find like a good enough like green t-shirt yet, but I've wanted to do like one where like, like a Halloween stream maybe where I wear the green t-shirt and I just end up being like this like disembodied head because uh, everything else is on there. Uh, the green eyes, you'd have to kind of play around with the uh, the chroma key. And I, I think 
I, I don't, I, it was just the blue for some reason. It really kind of did the distance. But even if you have like really green eyes, it might, that might actually have an effect there. And you might have to adjust kind of the chroma key standards. There are like settings that you can kind of make it so that it's more or less accurate on there. Um, some other accessories um, that you kind of want with the streaming is, uh, or you may want kind of with your live streaming, uh, the, the next thing is what they call a capture device. So a capture device is what it does is it allows you to bring in um, at this point HDMI sources. So like an HDMI source is like a like a DVD player, um, uh, another computer, or most notably like video game consoles. So things like the like a Nintendo Switch or a PlayStation or an Xbox, um, they they send their signal out to an HDMI, and what happens is this capture device takes that that signal and converts it to a way that the computer can use it as a video input. And when I when I do the OBS demo in just a bit, um, we'll, we'll look into, I have a capture device installed and it'll be able to kind of, and you'll be able to see kind of the, the content that gets kind of pulled in from there. Um, again, it depends on what you wanna stream. If you're just doing stuff on your computer, um, you don't need to have uh, that kind of capture device, but if you want to start kind of pulling in things from like outside sources, whether it be like another camera that maybe has an HDMI out on it there, or a video game console, or even another computer, a popular setup among kind of more elaborate streaming setups is you have your computer where you're doing the game or whatever you're trying to show uh, stream or record, and then you have the second computer that that actually does the streaming, because uh, a lot of things, if, if you're playing, especially like video games, and I, I'm just going to kind of assume with live streaming that we're going to be talking about video games, uh, because that's where so much of it kind of happens at, right now. But with with the video games, they can be really resource intensive on a computer. So they, they need they need to use a lot of the RAM, they need to use a lot of the processor, they need to use a lot of the the the, uh, the GPU or the graphics card. Um, and what happens is sometimes, depending on your computer, if it hasn't been upgraded enough in a while or isn't built kind of to be a powerful enough, there aren't really enough resources to do the live streaming part of it. So actually run OBS. Um, OBS really isn't a very intensive program, but depending on your computer, again, if you're just doing this on a laptop, you may not have enough resources to run OBS and the other software that you're doing because OBS is doing a bunch of processing and things in the background to kind of put together the video that's being sent out over the internet. So what they do is they have a computer that has, that's playing the game or doing whatever they're doing. And then they have the second computer that's running OBS. And what they do is they connect with an HDMI. Instead of going to a monitor on their computer, they go to the, the mon they go to that other computer, uh, the, the streaming computer as they call it. And that's where kind of all that kind of like that, that processing and sending out to the internet happens. Um, so that, that's just another use for a capture device. So the capture device is, is, is good if you're looking at kind of pulling in kind of different sources that you want to use. Um, let me see what I had in my, a couple others. I don't have them in the handout, but a couple others. Okay, yeah. So a couple other things you want to look at are things like a microphone arm. Um, I have one on here because what it does, it just gives me a little bit more flexibility about where I have the microphone. Um, the Blue Yetis come with like a, come with a little metal stand and they sit nicely on a desk. Um, and so they're a really great microphone for that there and such, but you're limited. You have to kind of make sure it's on the desk, kind of in a good place. Um, when I first started streaming, I had mine sitting on the desk and I did get some complaints about like, sometimes they weren't able to hear because I didn't have it close enough. I didn't have it angled properly. Um, so what happens is on the arm, this allows me, I can, I can push it away from my mouth if I want to, I can bring it closer. Um, or I can just kind of tuck it out of the way if I need to. Um, and I do get used to the fact it actually obscures my keyboard, um, but I get used to, I used to be kind of looking around over at my keyboard sometimes kind of like, okay, how do I get to the keys that I need to? Or if I like sit back further in my chair, I can kind of bring the, the microphone back and kind of continue, keep that kind of consistent uh, distance between my, my, my voice or my mouth and where the microphone is to kind of keep audio levels kind of consistent. So it just, it just adds kind of flexibility um, to kind of the setup and kind of what I'm doing. And then kind of the final accessory that I kind of was thinking about when I was kind of putting everything together is there are a set of devices out there that they call stream decks. And what they are is they're just like a little set of like programmable buttons. Um, they go from like six buttons to 15 to, I think there's like bigger ones now that are like 30 buttons. 
Uh, they are a bit pricey. So that's why they're kind of like usually kind of on the last line of kind of upgrades that you want to do. But what happens is you can program those different buttons to do various tasks for things that you normally would do. And when we get into the OBS demo, um, I, I'll, I'll talk about hotkeys, which is kind of a way to kind of change between scenes and, and, and do different actions on there. But what happens is those hotkeys you can program. So instead of having to hit a set of, series of keys on your keyboard, you can just hit a single button on this like panel. And you can have it set up. You can do things like mute your microphone or uh, change scenes or like just change a lot of things or just do different actions. People have them to play sound effects, uh, a whole variety of different kind of things. Uh, so it's just kind of like another little kind of toy gadget out there uh, for, for people who are doing the live streaming. So are there any questions on the, the equipment before I kind of go in and we're, I'm going to do kind of just a demo. I'm going to set up like an OBS kind of setup and kind of talk through kind of at least what I know or what I do uh, in OBS and, and how to do it on there and such. But if there's any questions for comments, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat or to... Uh, or if you want to hold on to them when we get into kind of the questions later on, I'm gonna we'll have a period of a Q and A uh, bit there. So let me uh, let me share the screen again, and we're gonna go back to OBS. So um, I did a brief tour of the interface before, but let me just kind of quickly kind of go over again. So right here on the top, the kind of the overwhelming section up here on the top is, is basically like your preview window. This is kind of where you assemble kind of your scene and you're able to kind of see everything that's kind of going on with that there. And then down here at the very bottom, so uh, down here on the bottom is we have several different sections. And if you notice, actually, um, there's these like little like uh, little icons at the corners of each of these here. And what this does is this actually allows me to actually pop out and you can actually move this kind of anywhere that you want it to go or you can kind of redock. So these are flexible. You can kind of arrange them uh, how you want them to be. Uh, so you don't have to always stick with the default. That's one of the nice things about OBS is that you can kind of really configure it to set up the way that you want it to be set up. So down here, we have four different sections uh, initially down here. And so the first thing over here on the left is the section called scenes. So scenes are your different views of what's being broadcast. Uh, this, is, this is kind of kind of putting together the components of what you're sending out onto your live stream. So a scene is made up of one or more sources. And um, some suggested scenes uh, that, that at least I have that I use is something like a pre-show scene. So something that's going to be there before you actually kind of get started. Because usually what you want to do is you want to uh, like start your stream and, and give people like a, like a few minutes or a little bit of time. Because uh, when, you, when you start it, there's like an announcement that's set out. People see that there. Allow them time to kind of trickle in and kind of get into your audience. You don't want to just start off with your introduction right off the bat. And then because then people who come in like a couple minutes late, they're, they're going to miss something there. So you want to kind of a pre-show and you can have it set up that there's like it's maybe telling people things are we're, we're going, everything's working, uh, everything will be starting in just a few minutes. Uh, maybe you'll play music during that scene. So something kind of there, but also something that if you need to, you can turn on your mic and, and speak to people. Uh, maybe there's a delay and you just need to, you want them to be patient or something. Uh, so a, a pre-show is kind of a good place to kind of start. Um, the next thing you kind of want to have is like a be right back or like a pause screen. So this is going to be something that you can bring up like midstream if you need to get up and go somewhere. Um, so if you need to like leave your camera area or you need to do something that you don't want to share on the broadcast. So like suppose you're doing something and you need to go in and enter in a password or something and you, you will basically want to like make it so they can't see uh, that happening on there. Uh, so you do kind of like a be right back. And so what it is, it's indicating that, hey, the stream is live. We, we know you're all there. The, the streamer is here, but maybe they had to kind of do something for a little bit. And then finally, you're going to have various scenes for different activities. And what you want to do is you want to think about what you want the viewer's focus to be on. So do you want them to be focused on you as the speaker? Uh, in that case, then what you do is you'll make your camera video source larger uh, and more prominent in the scene. Or do you want them to be more focused on like a window or a program or a game that you're demonstrating? And so you make that more prominent and you shrink down your camera and move it to the side or you can hide it completely. 
So um, I've done that with uh, with classes that I've live streamed for the Ferguson Library. Is that I have I have a scene that comes up that's that my voice that's like me kind of doing the introduction or talking about things that I'm not demonstrating, and then when I go to like Word or Excel or whatever there and such, I, I get rid of my face cam and what I'm sharing on the screen. That's the scene is the program that I'm sharing there. So you kind of think about kind of your different purposes and you can't, there are ways to kind of do things on the fly and kind of, and, and, and you can change things around like live, um, but it's always best to kind of think ahead and kind of plan ahead uh, for what you want to do. And that also just kind of helps you think about how you're going to present your content. Um, you think, okay, at this point now, I'm going to bring up my face and I'm going to be talking about this here. And then at this point, I'm going to transition over and show this demonstration, uh, or I'm going to be showing the game that I'm playing. Uh, and then I'm going to come back and talk. So you, then I'll go back to that face cam or I'll have the face cam and maybe I'll have a page where it's like me with like different information that's showing up on there. And so then once you have these scenes created, you can transition between them by using them in the scene box over here or by setting up hotkeys to kind of do uh, changes. So like you would have a hotkey that jumps back to, jumps to your be right back or pause, or you have a hotkey that jumps to your face cam on there. And we'll look at we'll look at the hotkey setup. There's, OBS has in some ways its flexibility can kind of make it a little overwhelming. And so there's hotkeys for so many different things, and things get added as you add in scenes and sources. They just kind of keep adding options for you to add a hotkey to it more than you can even have keys on your keyboard sometimes. So moving over from the scenes over here, we go over to the sources. So sources are all the different elements that you that your viewers will see and hear. So sources are audiovisual, and so there's things like there's like a webcam video source. Um, so you get your webcam, you know, and uh, there's audio. So what are you pulling in from your microphone, or are you pulling in audio from your computer on there? Um, and then there's like the the windows or programs that you want to broadcast. So are you broadcasting a game? Are you showing a utility or are you showing a web page? That's another element that you bring in there. And you can do things like images or other videos on there. And uh, when we start adding in scenes, you can kind of see the different things that you can want to do. Um, I talked about the preview box already up here on the top. Over here is the audio mixer, which when we add in audio sources, you'll see it'll add in the different, and you can then adjust your audio levels. So there are times like where if you're, if you have say a game playing on in the background and you're talking, you want your voice to be louder, louder than the game. You don't want the game drying yourself out. So you adjust the audio levels so that the, the game is less loud than your voices. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to be like peeking out or hitting the top of like your audio meter where like your, your microphone is able to kind of like crackles or it pops uh, because you're it's just taking in too much signal. So you kind of adjust kind of the volume levels uh, those ways using kind of the audio mixer there to kind of get a better balance for the audio that you're playing. Uh, and then over here we have the controls. So things like starting the stream or starting recording. Um, since a few versions go, I think about version 24 or 25, they've added in a virtual camera. So one of the cool things that you can do with, uh, with OBS is you could set up your scene. You can do all of this different stuff on here and such. And then you start the virtual camera. What it does is it kind of tricks your computer into thinking that the broadcast, what's coming out of OBS is actually a webcam. So what you can then use and say something like Zoom. So instead of it just being this raw camera coming in and such, you could do all the effects, everything that you want to do in Zoom. You could even do things like, um, um, I've used it actually, instead of doing like the share screen in Zoom, I've done it where it's just been my face and I've used OBS where I've kind of been able to use the transitions to different scenes where, okay, it's now my face or now it's the thing that I'm trying to, the, the, the presentation that I'm trying to share. Um, all because using this virtual camera over there. So it's, it's one of these kind of like really kind of neat tricks that they've done there is that it basically, it tricks your computer into thinking, hey, there's another webcam attached, but then you, anything that you put into OBS can be sent out as that web camera. Uh, and then there's settings uh, and then studio mode, what studio mode does is it's set up like, um, uh, if you've ever used kind of like, like a TV studio setup where you're able to kind of set up um, 
you're able to set up a scene or a shot or something there and such. And then you, you kind of, and then you have your live shot and then you have your setup shot and then you can transition from the live to the setup shot, which then becomes live. Um, and so it's a way to kind of maybe like prepare or set up things ahead of time, uh, studio mode, which is useful. Not if you, if you're live streaming by yourself and you, you want to be focused on what you're live streaming, you want to be focused on your audience. You're not sitting there trying to fiddle around in OBS, but if you're working in a situation where you have a team or a crew, they might be the one operating OBS and they can kind of set up the scene for like what will appear next. So it'll go from, okay, we're going from a, like a distant shot of say of a panel sitting. Um, I think you kind of in the sense that you have say like a camera that's showing like a panel sitting at a table uh, to a close up to the person, um, to the person who's speaking on there and such. And so you could set up that studio mode there. Um, but enough talking, kind of point out the different things. Let's actually, let me actually demonstrate because we're, we're almost at eight o'clock. So let me go through and actually demonstrate kind of how to start building things here in OBS. Cause that's kind of really what you're here for. You're here to actually see how OBS gets used. I've done a lot of talking, so let's demonstrate. So one of the first things that you want to do is you, up here, there's a, there's a menu called scene collection. And so what happens is, is depending on what you're doing for different purposes, you can set up different scenes, collections of scenes for different purposes. You can see I've created like a whole bunch here. Like I've done, I have one, right now we're in uh, for the Darien Library Workshop. So it's right now it's a new one that I created that doesn't have anything created. But I have things for like when I did library instruction, um, we did our Make Fest a few, uh, a couple of years ago, we did it virtually. I had did something I did there. Um, my setup for like Twitch streaming. Um, so I have different kind of setups, in, which gives me different scenes, different actions, uh, different sources coming in uh, based on kind of what I want to do. So what you do is you would, you would create a new scene collection for, for your live streaming in this case here. Um, and then the first thing that we want to do is we want to, um, it, when you first create it, it automatically creates a scene here just called scene. You can see down here in the bottom left, I'm going to move my mouse around a lot so you can kind of see where that is. Um, what I like to do is scene is not a very descriptive name. Um, I'm, I'm a very big fan of descriptive names, whether it be file names or things like this here. Because it just kind of reduces confusion in the future. You sit there, it's like, okay, do I need scene one, scene two, or scene three? And, and Three months down the road, if you if you close this, open it up, and you and you open it up three months later, it's like I don't remember what scene two or scene three was. But if I come in here and I right click and I rename it to um, what am I going to call it? We're going to call it live scene. We're going to create. We're going to build our live scene. So this is what's going to be live when we're talking on there. Uh, just going to call it live. And now I know that this is my scene that shows up when we're live. So. Now what happens is, is you can see I just have this nice big black box right up here at the top. And so this is where everything is going to kind of show up that I'm going to be broadcasting out in my live stream. But I need to start adding sources into this for things for people to see. So I do that there using the source box down here. And so I do that by first, I click the plus sign here. Uh, and you can see there's a big list of different sources that can happen, I can offer. So there's things like audio input capture. So audio input is um, a microphone or any other sort of audio that's coming into uh, your computer. So you could do say something like, um, uh, like there are, um, uh, you can buy like a, um, a turntable, a record turntable now that has like a USB out that you can, you can pull in, you can use it to digitize like records on there. But because it's an audio device plugged into your computer, it could count as an audio input. So you could actually have that record playing into your, your live stream or um, what kind of whatever purpose is on there. Um, audio output obviously is kind of whatever is going out, um, what, what source is kind of going out uh, on there. We'll, we'll look at that in just kind of a bit there. Um, browser is like a web browser. So you can kind of pull in content from Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Opera, kind of whatever browser that you're doing there. Uh, color source. So what color source does, and this is the first one we're going to kind of put in. Uh, what it does is uh, when we create a source, what this does is it's going to allow us to put a, a color in the background. So just instead of seeing this black here, we're going to uh, put in a, um, a color there. And what we're going to do is we can give it a name. And so again, as I said, having descriptive names is really useful. 
having color source really doesn't mean much. But if I tell it here and I give it a name to, um, we're going to do it as live background. So what this is saying, this is in the live scene, and it's the, the background uh, color for the live scene. Now you'll notice I have the option of being able to create a new one or add existing. Once you create a source um, for, for a scene, you can then reuse it in any other scenes or even reuse it in that scene again too. So like if I wanted to, like I could, I could, have, um, I could have a bunch of the same thing kind of showing up. Or if I have a live scene and say like a demo scene where I have something that I'm demonstrating on there, I could, um, I could use the same background or I could use the same kind of input that I set up in my live scene on there. Maybe I have it just in a different place. Um, so you can kind of think about how you're reusing things. But for here, we're just going to call it live background. I'm going to hit OK. And what happens is that um, you can then, this one here for color source gives us this color option here. And now I can kind of choose which color I want to do. So if I go to select color, I have our standard color panel, uh, everything that we're seeing here. I can choose kind of the basic colors. Um, if I had a specific color and I had the HTML hex code, I could enter that in and kind of get the really specific colors that I want there. Or I could do my um, RGB um, settings on there, or even like, uh, you, you, so you can kind of do a variety of things. Pick screen color would actually allow me to, um, gives me a little eyedropper that I can pick something on the screen and we'll pull that color there. For our purposes here, we're just going to use this default D1, D1, D1 uh, kind of color here. And then you have your size here. And so um, I have my, my scene here set up to give me a 1920 by 1080 resolution, because that's what I broadcast out. I broadcast out a 1080p uh, picture, because that's what my monitor size is. Um, if I had a bigger monitor, I might set that to like a larger size. Um, so I'm going to hit OK. And what this does now, instead of having that black background, I have a gray background uh, set up back here. And you'll notice now it's down here in the sources. It says live background. And if I wanted to, um, I can right click on it and I can go into properties and I can change that pretty easily if I wanted to. Um, you'll also notice over on the right now, there are two different kind of icons. The first one is this little eye. And what this is, is this is determining whether or not the source is visible or not. So when the eye is lit up like this, it's visible. If I click on it and you can see the eye gets a little crossed out. Uh, it's now hidden. We're back to our black background. Um, the other thing that we have over here is we have the lock um, icon. And what this does is if I turn it there, you'll notice the, right now that there's a, this red box with these handles around. This allows me, if I wanted to, I can resize it. I can, I can move it around wherever I wanted to do. Um, it does a nice handy little kind of click into, um, it will kind of like click onto either the edges or the corners uh, to kind of make you, you can line things up properly. If I move it outside of my source, you can kind of see that there's a, um, it's showing me that there is more of this object, but it's not visible inside my broadcast source. Um, so let me just move that there. And if I click lock, my, my border and my handles kind of disappear and now I can't accidentally move it. So if I'm moving other pieces uh, on, my, on my scene here, I won't accidentally move the background there. So you get kind of the habit of kind of like locking and unlocking things just so you don't accidentally move stuff around. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to now add in an overlay. An overlay is basically a, um, uh, it's, it's usually like an image. Sometimes it could be animated, but what it is, it's usually kind of a graphic overhead on there that you can uh, you can put in information or put in a design element on there. Um, for this purpose, I've, I actually, what I did was I went into PowerPoint and I just created a slide um, and kind of decorated. I think I, I just actually, it's just a color on there and such, but then I saved that as an image because PowerPoint's really easy to kind of do that kind of editing there. But because it's saved as an image, I'm going to go to add source and I'm going to choose an image source here. We're, we'll look at some of these other sources as I add them later on. Um, I'm going to go here and I'm actually going to call this um, border overlay because it, what it is, it's, it's just a border around my, my window here. I'm going to hit OK. And now what happens is, is now I'm in the image properties here. And you can see right now there's nothing showing up here because I haven't told it what image uh, to use. So I'm going to browse and I get my standard Windows um, browsing uh, 
format here. And I have it here. And we're going to do my demo overlay. So I hit OK. And we can see it's just this blue bar um, with kind of a blank space in the middle there. Um, and I'm going to hit OK. And now you can see it's here, but it doesn't fully fill up the space. So what I can do is I can resize it so it locks in. And so now when I broadcast this out, what they'll see is they'll see um, this blue border around, and then they'll have this nice box kind of the inside. And one of the nice things I like about using PowerPoint is you can go in and you can draw boxes um, where you can then say, put in like a video into there. So it's like, you can have stuff going on around the box, um, but it's, it's kind of like a defined area. So PowerPoint was actually, I found really useful for designing kind of overlays and, and kind of things. So if I actually, let me actually just quickly, if I show you kind of here, um, this is kind of what I use for kind of the library instruction there and such. You can kind of see, I have this setup that I, I did this in PowerPoint. I did like a, a, um, a, a transition kind of coloring there, but I was able to kind of put information to the text box. I was able to put our old logo here. And then what happens is that this would be kind of the place where my webcam would be coming in and I would be kind of speaking on there and such, and I would fit it inside this box here uh, kind of thing. Uh, let me go back here and we'll kind of go back to kind of what we're doing on the demo here. Um, Okay, so now we're going to add in another source. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to, uh, we're going to actually now put in some live content. We're not going to put in just a background or we're going to not put in like a, an overlay there and such. We're actually put in something that like that other people will see. So when you're working with um, your inputs, there are like three different um, uh, kind of three different kind of input sources that you can kind of come in. There's, uh, there's this game capture. And so game capture, uh, because so much live streaming is developed for like video game live streaming, um, this is just something that's kind of built into it there. Uh, do you use overlay as a brand identification? Yes, you can. So you can, um, and so you'll see that on a lot of other streamers. When I stream, I really don't. Um, I'm not really kind of doing a lot of branding. I'm a hobbyist. I'm not I'm not in it for money or fame or anything there, but you can. So you can have the, you can have like your, your name, logo, um, names are kind of questionable. You will see when we talk about safety tips about whether or not you want to have your name there, but it's a good place. You can put your brand identification as you saw on the, um, uh, on the one that I showed there for my, my instruction uh, slides, I did have like the Ferguson Libraries logo on there. In fact, actually what I, um, actually let me, we're talking about, it. let me just kind of show, if I go to my, um, my demo, oh no, God. Uh, yeah, okay, so here, this is not exactly, uh, <laughs> we've got this infinite look there and such, but if you notice down here in the bottom left, I actually have the logo kind of translucent there that's always visible too. So when this was showing up, um, like that logo was visible on there as well too. Um, but yeah, we have this kind of whole infinite kind of uh, view look there, which actually I think I was gonna do right now. Um, so as I was saying, game capture will, will automatically try to detect and load up a game uh, and add it into there. Um, display capture, what it'll do is it will capture everything that's on a screen. Um, and then there's window capture, which is down here and that will capture a specific window. So depending on like what you're wanting to stream and do, um, you, you kind of choose the capture that you want to do. Game capture is good. Sometimes it doesn't quite catch the game. Um, it doesn't reach the hook or whatever there and such. And so it doesn't see it. So sometimes you have to kind of revert to like a window capture or display capture if you're doing a game. Um, but most of them have been, it's, it's gotten better. But if you're not doing a game, you're doing something else. You're trying to show, um, uh, like you're trying to show something with Microsoft Office or you're trying to show something in a browser, um, but you don't want them to see anything else on your screen. You'll do window capture and you'll have it choose that specific window that you want them to see. And then if, if there's anything else that co goes over that screen, they'll still just see that screen. They won't see what you bring over it. They won't see anything that's happening in the background. They won't see like your like email notification alerts popping up or your start menu or anything there. Display capture just captures anything that's on the screen. And display capture is useful for, in fact, I like for, here in Zoom, um, I'm actually using display capture because I sometimes I'm, I'm hopping between different programs. If you're jumping between different programs, jumping between different windows, 
uh, if, if you do just window capture, you're going to have to keep changing which window it's looking at, unless you have it set up to capture all the different windows that you're going to open. But if you're like jumping between, you're going, you're going to a web browser and showing something, then you're going to Microsoft Word and you're showing something typed into there, or then you're going to um, like Twitter or like whatever you're, you're trying to do. You're, you're, you're showing like, like music or something on there or an image, like you open up an image. Um, if you're just showing your display, you can just bring into the display whatever you want them to see. The only thing to keep in mind is that they're seeing everything else that's on the display. Um, but in this, actually, in this exercise, I, I say all that there, we're actually going to do, uh, actually, you know what, since I keep talking about, let's actually do what I'm going to do briefly. You're going to watch me. I'm going to just open up a game in the background and we'll bring in a game capture here. Um, so this is just game gone home, but we're going to go back to OBS. Okay. So we're going to have this here. So that, that's just, that's just running in the background. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in, I'm going to add in a game capture. And we're just going to call it actually game capture, or you can just call it game. Um, uh, game. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to, and so what happens is when you do game capture, you can have either any full screen application, or you can have it go for a specific window or capture something in the foreground. Uh, the full screen application usually works pretty well. Um, but in this case, I'm going to actually do a specific window because I have it in the background and we're going to have it grab. Oops, it's not, you know, it's not seeing it because OBS opened up after or before I opened up the game. Uh, let me see if I do full screen. Let's see if I can get it to work here. Okay, does this work? Come on. Okay. Okay, so, it, okay, so I, I thought I was going to make this work. It's not going to work. So, you know, let's do, let's just do a display capture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and do a display capture. Uh, and we're just going to do display, just call it display. Okay. And we're going to do like our, like a little, uh, and I can tell it which display. I have three different monitors set up. Um, we're just going to tell it to grab monitor one. So we get this kind of infinite OBS kind of look on here. Um, and so now it's pulling in and what happens is, is now, once again, I have my red box around so I can resize or move. It's filled up the whole space because I have OBS filled into a um, 1080 or I have it filled up full screen. If I were to shrink this down, you can now see it will actually pull in everything else that's in my background. So you're seeing my icons in the background, you're seeing my start menu and everything there. So that, that's the risk of the display is it's showing everything that's there. Um, but if I wanted to, I can like resize this, uh, to a smaller size. Why are these white objects? Oh, I, I actually, you know what I did there? I resized my, my border overlay. Yeah. Oops. Um, so yeah. Uh, so let me just put that back to its normal size. Uh, and we'll go back to here and now I will resize this to fit into my little box that I made here for it to fit around. So now you can see I have the border going around my, uh, my, uh, my display capture that I'm pulling in. Now I'm going to hit, uh, I'm going to lock that. And I'm going to lock the border overlay because I accidentally resized the border overlay because I didn't lock it. Uh, now, one of the things you'll notice here is, is that these are listed in a specific order. And so what this is, is this is actually layered together. You remember when we did our live background, we did that gray, which we're not seeing now because it's at the, it's at the far back. It's at the bottom of the layer. And so everything else is kind of being stacked up on top of it. Um, if I wanted to, if I brought this up to the top, you can, I can rearrange these whatever order. Now you can see my background is sitting on top of everything, and it's actually obscuring everything that's behind it because the background fills up the whole space. Um, so usually, so what happens is usually you'll set up your background, it'll be down at the very bottom, and then you'll have kind of your, your overlay kind of be the next layer on top of the background. And then you'll have like your different display elements kind of going in. So we have the display here, which we're adding in kind of our, our OBS. We have this, this infinite kind of mind tripping look kind of going in. And so the final, th one of the last thing, or let's see, I have more stuff I'm going to add to this here. Um, 
let's move on. So, okay, so we've moved that. Um, I actually, I've, I've taught this as a class, so I have a whole set of exercises that I'm kind of like walking through, but it's been a while. So that's why I kind of keep referring to my, my notes on here. Um, so the other thing I want to add in here is I want to add in a face cam um, into this live scene. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and add source. And once again, I'm looking down and what happens is down here at the bottom, there is a video capture device. So video capture device is anything that's bringing video into your computer, whether it be like a webcam, whether it be like a, like a camcorder set up separately, or whether it's like a capture device. Like I was talking about the capture devices before. So when I do, um, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna bring in a video capture device. I'm gonna call it face cam. And I'm gonna hit okay. And so now what happens is I get to choose which device I bring in. So what happens is, is that um, right now, I actually have something hooked up into my, my capture card right now. Um, but if I go down, um, I, have, I actually have two webcams hooked into the computer right now because I have one webcam that's hooked up to Zoom and you're seeing it right now. But if I tried to use that in OBS, Windows doesn't like to use the same webcam for two different programs. So I was able to borrow a second webcam uh, that was, okay, so this is set up here. It's a little bit different angle than you're seeing me uh, on, on Zoom, um, but it's this is a second webcam that actually ends, ends up working. And so now you can see I've pulled in this video of me working. I would go in and I'd have to adjust settings on this webcam here. You can see I'm kind of blown out with the light and everything, the, the exposure and everything's kind of blown out, but I can actually resize this and I can say, put it wherever I want. So now what happens is I can be talking about what people are seeing on my screen, but they can see me talking here as well too. Uh, you can also see that when I brought that in, because the webcam has a microphone built into it, um, it also brought in its audio mixer. So the, the audio coming from it, it can include as well too. You'll also notice that this is now on top of my display back here. And that's because it's, it's layered to be on to slob. So if I put it down there, you can now see my display cuts off a part of me. Um, and so I can then readjust this to kind of whatever size. And you'll want to kind of, if you're going to have like a face cam in there uh, for whatever and such, do take a look at kind of the platform, kind of sometimes like the requirements, like, like Twitch for a while had a, like a requirement that your camera could only be like such and such size compared to the content that you're sharing, if you are sharing them simultaneously. Because um, what people were doing is they're creating their face cam really large um, and the content wasn't so big. And I don't know, there, there was a lot of issues. I kind of just kind of stayed out of that drama a little bit. Um, but yeah, so you would kind of set up and kind of move it around uh, to kind of where you want it to be. Uh, some people put it up in the top corner. Some people can put it like right in the middle. Um, so put it on top. Um, but you can also see that this is the kind of thing that if I wanted my, my camera to be the main source of my content, I can put it here, kind of right there. And if I wanted to, I could then hide it, show it if I wanted to kind of bring it up and I could make a hotkey that would then um, pull in the information. You can kind of see the, because this is not pointed correctly, my green screen uh, it does not covering the whole area. So you can see somebody walking back there. Um, so sorry about that. Um, but yeah, so that's how that is. Uh, so that's how we've added in kind of the different sources there. Now you can also add in like text in a couple of different ways into the, um, into the live stream. So if I go back into my sources, you can kind of see there is a text source here. And if I click this here, um, I can then, we'll just call it uh, title text, for example. And what happens is I can go in and I can type in, um, uh, right down here, I can type in the title of this uh, live stream. There we go. Um, and what it does, I just get a nice like block of white text. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna hide the display so we don't get that distracting kind of um, infinite image kind of going. Um, so you can type in whatever you want and then just resize it to kind of fit um, your overlay if you want to. So if I, if I shrink that to that size and then I can kind of move it to, unfortunately there isn't like a lock for center, um, but you can kind of just kind of estimate. Um, this might be something that like having it this way is something that I can easily change inside of OBS. Um, 
So it, it's convenient in that regards. Um, but if it's something that's going to be a bit more permanent, you can actually build it right into your overlay. So like if you're doing this in PowerPoint, you can, and I'm actually just going to hide the face cam here too. Uh, you can then just kind of um, build it into uh, PowerPoint and just kind of put it onto the slide as the text part there. Now, if you notice, there was also there was also a really interesting uh, kind of feature in here. Um, if I add in, and we're just going to add in sample text. Um, okay. And you notice there was a checkbox down here that said read from file. Now, this is neat because what this does is this allows you to have a separate text file that maybe won't be visible on your stream. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I have a text file that I've created before uh, and go there. And what happens is this is pointing at the text file and whatever text is in that text file, it's a .txt file, will show up where I put this, um, where I put this here. So now let's see if we can get this to actually work. It's really oddly sized. How is this like infinitely tall? It might be. I mean, oh my gosh. Okay, this did not work the way I expected it to. Let's see, this is what happens when you do a live demo. Um, Oh, thank you for coming. And um, if you do have questions, I'm sure you can ask at the Darien Library. They can reach out to me and answer questions as well, too. Uh, why? Yes, I want to remove sample text because it's not doing what I expected it to do. Um, okay, second. Okay. Oh, and you, actually, this is a good time here. You can see as I'm adding a text source, you can see down here in the add existing title text, the text source that I created before, that's still available for me to use again. So if I created another scene, I could easily pull that into that other scene. Okay, but we want to update text, read from file, browse. Wait, you know what it might be? It might be because that file is empty. There might be nothing in there. Yeah, that's why. This is sample text. There we go. There we go. This is all the fun part of uh, troubleshooting, uh, doing things live uh, on stream. Uh, there we go. So now you can see there. So there's the text that I typed in saying this is sample text. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to change the color. Can I change the color? Uh, that's the font. Here we go. Let's change, change the color. I'm going to change it to black. So I'm going to put it onto my gray background um, here so that we can kind of see it easier. Remember, remember contrast, it's always important. Um, so now th what this is doing, this is now showing whatever text is in that text file that I created. So what happens if I change the um, this is sample text that I changed off screen? Um, there we go. And now you can see it actually, uh, let's put in, character return there. Uh, so what I did was I, I changed it in the text file off screen and saved the file and it automatically updated here. So it's a, it's a really great way that if you wanted to say, I mean, there, there's, there's ways to set up things like counters, like, um, like if you wanted to have something like a counter that counted up or something, you could set up like a hotkey in Windows that automatically updates a text file. And then you can pull in the image from that text file and show the counter on your screen there. Uh, and it all happens within that program, uh, within the text program on there, but it updates and shows on here. So now that we've, we've kind of put in a bunch of our visual elements into here, um, we've put in our display, we have our face cam kind of showing up there, um, but you notice down in the audio mixer, nothing's getting picked up. There's no, there's no audio coming in. So what we need to do is we also just need to add in an audio uh, input capture. And we're gonna add in, um, I just like to call it microphone because I, I like to know that this is what my microphone's picking up. Uh, and then I can tell it to which microphone to pick up. And you can see I have a lot of different devices on my computer. I'm gonna tell it to pick up my Yeti, hit it okay. And now you can see as I speak, the meter down here is picking up and, and catching everything that I'm saying on there. Uh, and I can adjust the volume that's getting sent out through the stream 
uh, or I can I can raise it if I wanted my my voice to be a little bit louder. Uh, I'm going to just do a quick second scene here. Um, create another scene. So you can see I added a scene. And so I have my two different scenes here. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to quick put a quick uh, image background here. I'm running a little bit. I'm going to, I want to kind of get to question and answer. So, um, but I hope this was just kind of enough of kind of a demo to kind of just kind of show how OBS was kind of working. So we're just going to do background image. Um, Cause I just want to quickly show you um, uh, the, the settings and the hotkeys, just so you can kind of see where that is. Um, and I also just want you to, um, so I'm just going to kind of stick that uh, there. Oops. And there are, there, are, there are tricks. If I open this up, if I right click on here and go to transform, I can make it like fit to screen. It will automatically kind of adjust and kind of fit things around on there. So this one here just happens to be, um, have black borders around it there. Um, but so you can kind of see, I can add it and then I can change between my different scenes and depending on if I was streaming or broadcasting, uh, what they're seeing on here would be what they see at that time. Uh, so a quick thing here into the settings. Um, there's a bunch of different kind of things here in the general that you'll kind of walk through. On, on the handout that I, I sent everybody, there, there's a bunch of resources out to the OBS wiki at the end. OBS being an open source project means that there's a lot of people and a lot of people use it. So there's a lot of people working on it and building it and making it better, but there's also a lot of really good documentation out there. So generally, if you're, you're having a problem or you're trying to figure out how to do something, there is somebody out there who's had the same question or tried to figure out the same thing. And uh, the answer is out there. That's generally kind of what I've found. Uh, so you have your general, just kind of how the program itself is kind of working. Uh, stream. So this is where you actually set up where you're going to be streaming out to if you're streaming with, uh, with OBS. Um, you can choose the service that you're going to. And so if we open this up, you can kind of see um, they have Twitch, they have YouTube, they have Facebook Live, uh, Twitter offers some live streaming. Uh, there's Restream IO. Uh, you can do custom. Uh, and then what happens is, is down here, there's uh, you once you choose the platform that you're streaming out to, uh, you have to either connect your account. This is this is actually reasonably new for OBS. Uh, it used to be just the stream key. Uh, so connect account means I click there and I would sign into my Twitch account and Twitch would then ask me, it's like, hey, do you want to connect this app there? And, such? and I'll say, okay, yeah, sure. I'm the one that did it. Uh, and it'll, it'll make all the kind of connections in the background. Now the stream key is the kind of the old fashioned way of doing it there. And what the stream key is, is that when I created an account on Twitch, they gave me this like 16, 18 digit long or 18 character long uh, key that's a bunch of random letters and numbers together that is my unique identifier on the broad on their broadcast there so what happens is that when the twitch servers receive a signal that's encoded with that key they know it goes to my channel uh, you always want to make sure that the stream key you keep it secret like absolutely secret um, because if anybody gets that stream key they can then broadcast out to your channel. And so um, Facebook uses a stream key. Uh, actually, what happens is Facebook's kind or uh, not Facebook, uh, YouTube uses a stream key, but YouTube stream key is on a per video basis. So when you create each individual video, um, there'll be like a different, I mean, there are ways to use the same one if you use the same, like same video that people keep coming back to. But every time you create a new broadcast on YouTube, it creates a new um, uh, broadcast key that you then have to put into OBS before you stream to it. Uh, Twitch has just a single one for your channel. And every time that you, you stream, it just goes right to that channel. And it's, so what happens is the disadvantage and advantages is that Twitch, you don't have to go in and keep changing that setting every single time you want to stream. You just turn it on, start streaming, and your, your channel goes live. YouTube you can actually, um, if you have multiple people connected to your YouTube channel, so um, you can actually have uh, simultaneous streams going to YouTube on your channel at the same time, because each individual, each individual video, each individual broadcast would have its own um, uh, uh, key that it would be sharing out there and showing. 
Uh, so then you, you put in the stream key and you would like copy and paste it over there and it's, it's all grayed out. I'm not going to click the show because that would show you what my stream key is and allow you to access my Twitch channel. Uh, output, this is where you kind of set kind of uh, what you're outputting, the, the, the resolution, the audio that you're using, the encoding that's happening there. And there's all these formulas to kind of figure out like what this video bit rate should be. You, you do like, a, um, like an internet connection check uh, and then you say, okay, a certain percentage of that is what you want your video bit rate to be. Uh, audio, this is where you determine your audio formatting there and, and how different kind of audio devices kind of get set up and work around. Um, video, this is where you set up your resolution. So like when I first started this up here, we had 1920 by 1080, and that's because I had it set in here to do that there. If I wanted this to be larger or smaller, I can, I can adjust it right into here. But I really want to show you the hotkeys here. So the hotkeys are the ways that you can kind of uh, run actions without having to click around OBS. So if you're busy running um, your stream and doing things, you don't want to have to go to OBS, especially if you're using just a single computer with a single screen, you have to get out of whatever game or thing that you're doing, bring up OBS. And if you're displaying, you're showing your display, you're showing them your OBS kind of set up there and you're having to click around. But if you've set up like hotkeys for, for common tasks, so you can see I have set up here for starting streaming and starting recording. And you notice I actually use the same, um, actually as I use actually this here is control shift and it's open bracket, this is control shift close bracket, but I could use the same um, command um, here, I could use con uh, control shift open bracket and control shift open bracket. And when I hit that, it will do both actions at the same time. Um, going down, you can kind of see pause recording, um, virtual camera stuff. So all the stuff that's over here on the controls, there's start streaming, there's start recording, there's start virtual camera. Those are all actions that I could set up a hotkey for. Um, so things like, um, and so then now we scroll down and now you can see we have broken up by my different scenes. So we have my be right back scene that I created and there's my live scene. I can set a shortcut that would allow me to, um, if I do control shift L for live and control shift B for be right back, if I hit okay, now if I, right now I'm in my be right back scene, you can see right now activated is be right back. If I hit control shift L, it transitions over to my um, my live scene. If I want to go be right back, control shift B and change back to that there. So now I can get up and walk away if I wanted to. Um, and what happens is you can also, the final thing here, just with the hotkeys, is if we look here and such, you can notice that each of the different elements, each of the different sources that I put into my live scene, I can also assign a keyboard shortcut to. So I can, um, uh, so I can actually hide or show different elements with a simple like couple key presses. Um, so when you're, when you're setting up your streaming process, you want to kind of think about what you want to do. It's, there's a lot of preparation, a lot of thinking ahead of time to kind of get into and lead there. Um, so again, get into play around and look online. Um, I want to, the last thing I just kind of just want to go over quickly today is I just kind of want to go over just kind of like some safety and kind of just a quick brief kind of safety streaming tips kind of there. Um, these are just kind of things that I've, I've done some kind of research kind of looking up and just kind of the advice that kind of people are told. I'm going to go back to just normal vo uh, face here so you're not seeing uh, OBS any longer. Uh, and now's the time if you want to start putting questions into the chat, actually, I'll, I'll stick around and kind of answer some questions as well, too. Um, so one of the things you want to do is you want to kind of maintain your basic account security. So all the stuff that you kind of do online for your own safe security, you want to make sure you keep up with your, your live streaming as well, too. Uh, so things like use strong passwords um, and two-factor authentication, because again, Anybody um, who gets access to your account will then be able to live stream on your channel and might be able to change account information um, on there as well too. Uh, there's um, and make sure that you keep your stream key confidential because as soon as somebody gets that, um, Twitch does make it very easy to regenerate a new Steam stream key if you need one. Um, but then you just have to go through the hassle of kind of resetting it up in OBS. 
uh, do not use your real name. Uh, sadly enough, this is actually one that I don't follow. Actually, I was reading everything I was reading says, do not use your real name. Do not use your real name. It's like, okay, my, my Twitch channel is F Scornia. It's like, mm, maybe I should go in and kind of put in a new handle for that kind of thing. Um, but I'm not famous. I, nobody ever kind of watches. So there's nothing really, it's like, I, I don't, I have, I, in all these years I've had maybe like on the kind of number of my hands, trolls coming into my chat, kind of doing anything. So right now it's not an issue. Um, there's recommendations, use a separate email address for your streaming identity. So don't tie it to your personal um, email address. Uh, a lot of this is to help reduce things like doxing or what they call swatting, which the, if you really kind of get into it, like, there's some like really nefarious mischief makers out there doing things. Uh, don't share your location or address. Um, and when you're sharing stories online, because you'll be talking online, you'll be sharing stories, you'll be saying, oh, do this, I do that kind of thing. Just be aware of what information uh, that you're sharing that could be cross-referenced to find you. I mean, I've said on this Zoom meeting, which is all of you here and such that I work at the Ferguson Library in Stanford. I mean, if you wanted to, you could go find me pretty easily based on that information. And also kind of pay attention to what's in your background. Uh, and kind of reducing and kind of identifying information. Another reason the, the, the green screen is kind of nice because it just kind of blocks out any sort of uh, any sort of that information. It allows me to present out to you what I want you to see instead of anything that's just kind of happening back there. In this case, it's a um, it's a, a, a sun with rings going around it. Um, and then every platform has its moderation tools. Um, for things like chat or whatever. So there's things like profanity filters. Um, if you want those, turn those on so that people can't swear or use uh, really offensive terms in, um, in your chat. Um, ban and report troll, trolls and scammers. Don't allow, um, uh, uh, don't, don't give them any kind of quarter. Don't allow them to kind of do anything. Just, just ban them, just kind of get rid of it. There's such, the more people that ban them and report them, uh, the less that they'll be able to bother other people. Uh, and you can consider setting up and installing like a chat moderation bot, um, which are bots that you can actually set up certain rules that will be allowed to what shows up in your chat, whether people are able to share links or whether like certain words are getting used. Um, and don't hesitate about pausing your streaming content to deal with a problem. At this point, everybody knows um, uh Kind of that you're, the people are streaming, especially if you're one person doing it by yourself, th they know, okay, if you say, okay, I have to go off and take care of this here and such, uh, they'll be forgiving on it there. And then practice mindfulness while you're streaming. Um, take breaks, especially if you're streaming for extended periods of time. I mean, there are some people, uh, my streams tend to last between two to two and a half hours, not a very long time, but I've done six, seven hour streams uh, at times. People do much longer kind of things. Uh, so you want to take breaks, get up, walk around, uh, get away from the screen for a little bit, uh, stay hydrated. Um, so I actually, I, I actually haven't gotten to it tonight, but I actually have like my, my bottle of water. I actually been talking this whole time and I haven't uh, actually stopped. Um, but having to refill your beverage is also a good excuse to a good reminder to take a break. Um, and then consider your ergonomics, like have a comfortable chair. Don't be leaning hunched forward. Uh, avoid uh, repetitive stress injuries or like bad posture on there. Uh, so that's just kind of a few things. I'm going to quickly, um, before I get to questions, I'm just going to quickly drop in the the handout again that has some of this, all this information in there. So if people missed it earlier, they can grab that too, again. And I see we had a couple questions. Uh, the first one, uh, XSplit versus OBS. So uh, XSplit is one of the early uh, streaming kind of software out there. And uh, it's great. When I first started doing this, like six, seven years ago, OBS was, like, it had just kind of gotten launched. I think I started like right around version like 0.13 or something of OBS. But at that time, like the options out there, XSplit was one of the options uh, for streaming out there. And they didn't offer like a free trial or anything. So it was a paid service. Um, so I, unfortunately, I haven't had much experience with it. Um, I like OBS, uh, mainly for like it's open source, it's extremely flexible and it's absolutely free. Um, free as in puppies in that uh, there is some work involved with it, but there is no cost with it there. And, and because it's open source, people have built upon it. Um, my actual streaming software I actually use is actually Streamlabs. 
uh, which was a piece of software that was built on top of OBS. So it, the, the whole setup with Streamlabs uh, is, is the same as OBS. It's the same scenes, the same sources. In fact, I was able to actually import everything I did in OBS right to Streamlabs when I first uh, set up. Um, but it offers kind of a more integral connection to the platform. So like in Streamlabs already, I can see the chat for my channel. Uh, and I can see kind of my my follower, like when people, I, nobody follows me, but uh, when people did occasionally do follow me, I can see it kind of show up and see those statistics kind of showing up in there. So I don't have to keep, when I was streaming with OBS, I would have to, I'd open up um, a Firefox and I would have my my channel, on the, the dashboard of my channel open up there, be able to see the chat and be able to see my preview. But all of this now is in one program with Streamlabs um, on there. But so XSplit is is one of is actually one of the originators of kind of streaming software out there. They're they're one of the early ones out there. They're good, um, but and they may even have free trials now. It's something I have looked at, um, but it's a good question. Uh, my my I lean towards OBS because. It's what I know and it's, uh, it's extremely flexible. I haven't found anything that I wanted to do that I haven't been able to do with OBS yet or found an explanation online of how to do it because uh, it just has a really great community. So now we have the question, how does one avoid copyright infringement on background photos? I will stream crystal healing shows and have to procure my own photos. So yeah, so copyright is an important thing. It's more notable with things like music. Um, things kind of crack down a lot more on music. Um, but with like photos, uh, my like, with images, well, my suggestion would be to be like, look for things that are um, creative commons or um, like royalty free kind of things. Not all royalty free things are free, but there are ones that are free out there that the most that you maybe have to do is maybe put in an image credit. And you can do that like either into your overlay or you can just mention it while you're streaming. Oh, this image is coming up and this is who it's credited to. Um, or um, you can use your own photos if you have photos that are kind of aligned to that kind of thing um, that for what you want to use because you own the copyright to your own photos. Um, music is a, a more serious kind of issue. Um, uh, and there's been a lot of crackdown on music uh, related there, but in response, a lot of the streaming platforms have also set up um, kind of ways that you can kind of bring music into your streams. So YouTube has the YouTube Music Library, which is a whole, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty comprehensive like library of music uh, of a variety of different genres and types that you are allowed as a creator, as a YouTube creator, whether you're streaming or whether you're creating a video that you're putting onto YouTube, you have permission to use any of this music in your videos and you will not get a copyright claim or a copyright strike on your account. Um, yeah, at one point I went in and tried to look whether the, the, you could use the YouTube stuff for like Twitch, but you really can't. Um, the, the licensing is just not there. Uh, but Twitch has created, um, what do they call it now? Uh, they have created a soundtrack. Okay, they, they've created a, um, a, a platform called Soundtrack, um, Soundtrack by Twitch. And what it is, is it's, it's like you have a whole access to a whole bunch of like radio, radio channels, like different music that, that has been pre-cleared by Twitch to be able to use on your Twitch stream. So what happened, what Twitch used to do um, is that if licensed music was detected on your stream, so whether you were playing a game that played like a, like a rock song or something on there and the copyright thing went about and such, is they would mute that section of your stream. So if somebody went back and like rewatched it, uh, there would actually be like a quiet, silent section in that part of the stream. What Soundtrack does is it's a bunch of pre-cleared music, but then you, the way you set up, it actually connects into OBS um, is that it plays and people hear it on the broadcast, but then Twitch will filter it out of your, your video on demand recording. So if somebody came back and watched it later, they would not hear the, the music in that part, um, but they would still hear you talk. Because the thing about the, the whole like muting with the copyright stuff before was it also mute any sort of microphone input. It, everything would just be mute. So you'd be sitting there talking and nobody would hear anything because it was just a muted segment. 
So th there are, they're, they're trying to figure out ways to kind of allow people to use certain content on these streaming platforms. Um, but you do have to be careful. And a lot of times it depends on like your size of channel too, is that the idea is that if you're, you're really, I mean, if, I mean, they have automated systems out there that might go out of the, I, the question about images that would need a visual check. Whereas music, there is actually an automated copyright bot on Twitch that's sitting there listening to it and it will actually report like the copyright. Uh, YouTube also has it as well too. Um, but images would be something else. So it would have to be somebody who actually sees it and maybe put it in an infringement. But a lot of time, with, whether or not the hassle happens there, but you always want to kind of, kind of steer on kind of the side of legality rather than taking the risk that there's somebody's going to kind of send down kind of a lockdown or kind of a takedown on there. Okay. So I'm not seeing any other questions. I had a really great time talking to all of you. Um, if you do have any other questions that come up or you do start kind of getting in and trying and playing around with all this and such, and you have questions, um, uh, I'm sure uh, at Darien Library, I'm sure that they'd be okay if you kind of reach out to them, they can connect to me and then we can kind of I can answer questions that way or we can kind of connect directly on there uh, however it kind of gets set up um, but I had a really great time with this and I hope you kind of learned something uh, from it all.